Aloha and welcome to our video on the Kingdom Plantae. Today we will look at the difference between vascular and non-vascular plants and we will describe the features of two phyla, the Bryophyta and the Polypodiophyta. All right, when we talk about the Kingdom Plantae, we have four phyla that we're going to discuss. The first is the Bryophyta or the mosses. Um, we also have the Polypodiophyta or the ferns. We have the Coniferophyta, sometimes called the gymnosperms, and these are going to be our pines, our fir, and our spruce trees. And then we'll have the anthophyta or the angiosperms, and these are going to be our flowering plants. So the mosses, the bryophyta, are going to be non-vascular, and we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. They're low-growing, they're small, they live in the moist area, um, they'll produce their spores, they get their water through rhizoids, so they don't really have true roots, and then they have an alternating life cycle of alternating generations. So I'll show you all that in a couple slides. Um, the ferns we'll also talk about a little bit later in the video, and these are our vascular plants. They tend to be a little bit larger. Um, they have big fronds as leaves. On the underside of the fronds, they have soria, which produce spores. And a lot of the ferns in past times are what have become our fossil fuels. The coniferophyta, we'll talk about that one a little bit later on, and then as well as the anthophyta. So when we hear the term vascular plants, what we're talking about is these vascular bundles, vascular tubes. These are the tube plants. And what they do is they primarily will have two different tubes. One of them is the phloem here, and that one starts up primarily in the leaves, and it takes the food and the energy that it produces in the leaves and transports it down through the plant to the remaining parts of the plant. The other type of vascular tissue we have is the xylem, and the xylem will take water from the roots of the plant and then transport that up to the leaves where it can be used for photosynthesis and for just the plant to have as well. So when we talk about this vascular nature of plants, what we're talking about is do they have dedicated tissues for transporting this food and water? The first phylum in the plants that we'll discuss is the bryophyta or the mosses. Now the bryophyta has a couple different things I want you to realize. First, it has this split duality to its nature. It'll be a saporophyte plant, okay, which was actually a diploid condition. So that's after we have some fertilization, we have the ability for it to like blend the traits together and work that way. In here, it goes through the process of meiosis and makes these spores, which are gonna be haploid. The spores are then spread out, and those are going to form our gametophyte plants, which are going to be haploid condition, and then those will produce sperms and eggs, and then those will come together for fertilization, and this cycle continues. So this is when we talk about this alternating generation between being haploid and diploid. Now, our mosses, as you can see in the picture here, they tend to be, and here, a little bit lower to the ground. Um, this one's kind of neat because you can see what we generally consider to be the moss part here, the gametophyte, and then we'll see some saporophytes up here coming up on the top. So all in all, this is what it breaks down to. We can see it here. It doesn't really have a true root system. Instead, it uses these things called rhizoids. And then it does have, in the gametophyte stage, a stem-like structure and then a leaf-like structure. So not true root leaves and stems. Because it's not vascularized, this is why they have to stay low. They don't have the ability to transport the materials great distances. And then you can see the sporophyte over here developing above where we'll have a stalk and a capsule, and then the capsule is where we're going to be filled with these spores that will later be released. So those are our basic mosses, and this is the phylum bryophyta. And in the phylum polypodiophyta, our ferns, what we notice is here we're starting to see vascularization of tissue. So we start to see the phloem and the xylem. So we can see a larger plant, they get to be a little bit bigger. And what we'll notice is when we look at the adult plant over here, that it's going to be a diploid stage. Okay, so it is actually will come through some process of fertilization, which we can see here, and then it'll kind of grow out from that way. Now, our mature sporophyte, you can see it has the frond leaves here. On the other side, it has the soy where it produces the spores. Okay, and then we'll see the sporangium here. It goes through meiosis, and then it releases these spores out, and the spores are going to be a haploid again. The haploid spores grow into a young gametophyte. The gametophyte will mature, and from there, what it'll do is it'll form this antherid and this archegonium, and this is where we form our sperm, and then we'll form the egg, and we get our fertilization, and the process continues. Now, with the ferns, because it's vascularized, they're able to get a lot bigger. They can transport water 
throughout their entire being. So from the roots, it can take that water up to the leaves or to the fronds, but also the energy that it makes in the fronds through photosynthesis is able to transport that down through the rest of the plant as well. Okay, so that's it for our brief introduction into the plant kingdom. We'll pick it up a little bit more in our next video. Good luck in the lessons, and as always, we'll see you in the next video. Aloha, and welcome to our video on gymnosperms and angiosperms. Um, the goals today will describe the features of the phylum coniferophyta and the anthophyta. In the phylum coniferophyta, or the gymnosperms, what we're talking about is we have seeds that are open. They're naked seeds. They're not wrapped up. They're not protected. Um, is a seed part, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, this is a plant. It does have a root system that you'll see underground. There are stems to it, and we do have needle-like leaves. Most of the leaves are going to be this way. Um, these tend to stay green all year round, and the reason these needle leaves work well is because unlike a traditional leaf that we're thinking about, these needles are able to withstand a little bit more extremes in temperature, so they're actually able to use photosynthesis year-round, not like some of our other trees where they drop their leaves in the wintertime. Now, the conifera phyta are named so because of these cones that they have, and this is where we see seeds, and this is where we see reproduction happening. So we'll actually have male and female plants, and if you notice, sometimes in the spring, the pollen will be spread out, and you'll see an awful lot of that yellow pine pollen everywhere. Now, when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is here we have our cone here, and it'll open up when it's time to release the seeds, and we'll see the seeds here, and they're exposed. This gymnosperm means naked seed, so you can see that it's not wrapped up in anything. The cone will provide a little bit of protection. The scale will provide a little bit of protection, but the seed itself is kind of open and exposed out to the environment, and this is what makes them the gymnosperms or the naked seeds. Now, unlike the gymnosperms, we have the angiosperms and the phylum anthophyta. And the angiosperms are going to be the seeds that are protected per se. And we'll see that down here where we see our seeds down here. But now these are going to be protected by a fruit. So you can see how the seeds are wrapped up inside of something. It gives a little bit of protection. It can give a little bit of nutrients. It also helps with seed transport. Now, in the anthophyta, we have the flowering plants. And that's kind of important for us because we do have these flowers and the flowers are basically their organ for reproduction. Um, what we have is the stamen over here and then we'll have the pistil part over here. The stamen is going to be the male part. We'll have a little filament here and you can see it extending up this way and on top of it we have the anther and that's where they have the male pollen. Okay so like the sperm so to speak is going to be right there. Now if I'm a bug or a bird or something that's coming in to pollinate here I'm going to get this pollen on me from this anther and what's going to happen is then I'll go to another flower and I'll feed off of this stigma part here which is kind of sticky and when I stick my face in there to get the nectar out the pollen that I've gotten from another flower will get stuck to the stigma it'll transfer down the style here into the ovary where we'll have fertilization and then this ovary here will swell and ripen into the fruit. So that's how the flowering plants basically work. Now, the flowering plants can be broken down into two groups. What we have is the monocots and the dicots, or monocotyledon and dicotyledon. And that cot part refers to this cotyledon, which is going to be this embryonic leaf. So in the monocots over here, mono means one, so they have one cotyledon. Our dicots on this side we'll have two of these embryonic leaves in the seeds. Okay, so that's why they're named monocot and dicot. Now the differences between those groups don't just stop with the number of embryonic leaves. If we look at our dicot, generally our flowers of a dicot is gonna have four or five floral parts. Okay, so you'll see in this one here we have five different parts to the flower, whereas our monocots generally only gonna have three or multiple of three. So in this case, we could have three distinctly orange ones, or we could have six if you add in the yellows as well, but it's a multiple of three nonetheless. The other way you can easily tell between a monocot and a dicot is if we look at the leaf veins. In a monocot, it's gonna be all parallel running this way. Okay, so you can see all of the veins going this way, whereas in a dicot, they're going to be net-like, and you can see it here where it's more spread out and web-looking. Okay, and then finally, the last one I want to mention is how the vascular tissues are going to be bundled and arrayed. In a dicot, it's going to be a ring system, 
and then when it's a monocot, they're just going to be kind of grouped together. There's no necessary or set pattern. So that's it for this video. Um, it's just a quick overview. You'll get a lot more information in the lessons, and good luck on those. And as always, we'll see you in the next video. Aloha and welcome to our video on plant structure and function. Um, today we will talk about the structure and function of roots, stems, and leaves. And finally, we'll have a brief discussion on tropisms. So today we'll start our discussion on plant structures with roots. Now the roots provide an important part for the plant. They anchor them into the ground. They get water up from the soil. They also get nutrients from the soil. And then it uses the vascular tissues to transport that materials to the other parts of the cell. We have two different kinds of root systems that I want you to be familiar with. There's multiple variations on these. Um, the big ones are going to be this taproot system like here where we'd see like what we would expect a carrot to be looking like. But it doesn't have to be swollen like a carrot is. It could be just a normal single solitary root where it just kind of branches off like that. Now the opposite of this one is going to be a fibrous root system where you can see it's just this group, this tangled web of roots. And we can see another example of it down here as well where we can see how it's just going to be these variations. So you'll either have one solitary root coming down and it'll branch off or you'll just have this fibrous network that's going to be out there. Now when we talk about roots, there's a couple parts you want to know. We do have the root tip here and that's where it grows. So it'll actually, this region of elongation is going to be here in the root tip. And then below that, we have the root cap. And the root cap is going to be kind of like cells that are a little more tough. They're a little more durable. And as it grows in this region of elongation in the root tip, it'll push this root cap through the ground or through the rocks or whatever. That's how it makes space for the roots to grow. And we talked about how the nutrients and things will be coming in. Those will come in through root hairs primarily. And we can see it going on here. And then if we look, we have our xylem and our phloem here. So the phloem will bring us energy and things like that down to the root tip. And the xylem is where we'll transport the water upwards. So we can kind of see how the roots work and what they're doing here. And basically, remember, they're the anchor, but they also are how they get a lot of their nutrients and their water in plants. Okay, as we move up the plant, we get to the stems, and the stem serves a primary purpose. What it's supposed to do is, if we remember, we had the roots down here, which basically get nutrients and water. And then we have the leaf, which is the most important part because that's where photosynthesis happens. And the stem quite simply holds the leaf up so it can get a little bit more sunlight. Now there are two basic types of stems. We have a herbaceous stem and we have a woody stem. The herbaceous stem is going to be primarily green in color is what we'll notice. They're flexible. Um, these are going to be in plants that grow an awful lot faster um, or just grow for a single season. And that's simply it's as quick as it can get the job done, throw up the leaf, let it photosynthesize, and be done with it. The woody stems tend to be a little bit more durable. And this is like what we would see in a tree or something like that that's going to spend multiple years growing and getting larger and larger. And, and it's able to support more weight, so these will be a lot taller, but also it'll survive a longer period of time. So remember the stem, the only portion that the stem does is it's basically trying to get the leaf up off the ground so that you can expose it to more sunlight. And that brings us to the leaves of the plant. And the leaves are probably the most important part of the plant, especially for us. And it's in the leaves where we have photosynthesis occurring. So what we're talking about when we talk about the leaf is you have the blade over here, which is the main part of it. You can see that it'll have this like stalk here that'll come out a midrib and then these veins that come off and this is where our vascular tissues are going to run and such like that. Now if we take a cross section of the leaf you'll notice that it has this epidermis here and here and that's going to be protection. It's going to provide a little bit of protection for the leaf to make sure that it, the important things are being taken care of inside. The inside part is the mesophyll here and you'll notice that there's a little bit of gaps and spaces here in between the cells and that allows gas exchange with the, through the stoma. So on the bottom side of a leaf is where you'll see these stoma, or these openings, and that'll allow gas exchange to occur. And it's in here where we start to see this photosynthesis occurring. And you'll notice that we have our vascular bundle here, so water will be transported up through the xylem, and then this energy and the sugars and things will be passed down through the phloem to the rest of the plant. So the leaves are basically why we have the plant. That's what happens with the photosynthesis. 
And I just wanted you to see that there's a bunch of different kinds of leaf patterns that are out there in nature. Okay, so that's it for the root stems and leaves. And I wanted to conclude our talk with a little talk about tropisms. Now, when we talked about what it takes to be alive, we said that you have to respond to a stimulus. And in plants, we don't really see this a lot. It's not like you can walk up to a plant and go, boo, and it'll run away. So it does react to a stimulus. And depending on what the stimulus is, that's what we call this reaction. The reactions in plants are what we call tropisms. So the easiest one and the most obvious one is going to be a phototropism. And that means that basically, notice that the plant's stem is growing towards a light source because the stem's purpose is to get the leaves closer to the light. So if you have a plant and you have a window and the plant's not quite centered in the window, it's off to the side, you'll see that the plant will kind of lean towards like we see here and it'll actually grow towards the light. Now, there's a response to gravity called gravitropism. And what that's going to be is that our plant's stem, once again, is going to grow away from the pull of gravity. So if I had a plant and I knocked it over, what you'll notice is that that plant's going to try and reach up to the sky. And remember, the stem is doing this, and the reason for it is, is it wants to get these leaves up and into as much light as possible. So gravitropism is when it reacts to gravity. Okay, next up we have thigmatropism, and that's going to be towards touch. And this will be primarily in vines we'll see, where you'll see the plant grow out and it'll have a little curly here and as soon as that gets onto something that's that curly part will go around so it's a response to touch there are also plants that will actually react to a touch and that would be a different type of thigmatropism something like a venus fly trap so when a fly lands inside of it and triggers a little hair it'll close up its leaves and then it'll secrete out a digestive enzymes and that's how it'll get some of its nutrients and then the last one is this hydrotropism, and that one's basically going to affect the roots of a plant, and that's where the roots are going to find water. So it'll send out a bunch of different roots. So if we have our tree over here, and a bunch of roots have been sent out everywhere, and it finds water over here, then what the plant will do is it'll send more roots to where it finds that water so that it's able to get enough water for the plant to live. Okay, so that's it for our video today. Um, good luck with the lessons as always, and we will see you in the next video. Aloha, and welcome to our first video on animals, the Invertebrate One video. Um, in this video, we will describe the eight common features of organisms in the kingdom Animalia, so what makes them an animal. And then finally, we will describe features of sponges, cnidarians, flatworms, roundworms, and segmented worms. Okay, let's begin our discussion of the kingdom Animalia by going over the eight features of animals. These are the eight characteristics that make them an animal. The first is they are heterotrophs, which means they're not able to make their own food, so they have to ingest or consume food to get their energy to carry out their functions. They also have coordinated movement, which means they move around because they have muscle cells, and these muscle cells are governed or coordinated by the nerve cells, so they know what they're doing. They are multicellular, they have more than one cell. They are diploid, so they're gonna have two copies of each chromosome, one from the male parent and one from the female parent. They do reproduce sexually. Um, they develop what we call a blastula, and that's a hollow ball of cells that'll then form three layers, and from this we develop into the entire organism. They don't have any rigid cell walls, and they do have tissues. So animal cells are gonna be organized into groups that'll work together. We'll talk more about the tissues and the organ systems a little bit later on in this course. Okay, so let's start exploring the phyla of the animal kingdom. The first one that we'll talk about is the porifera or the sponges. And you can see a picture of a natural sponge over here. Um, most of the sponges have the same basic body shape, but they'll change it up a little bit. What they'll have is a central cavity that you see here, and they'll have a bunch of pores. And into the pores is where this water will flow into here in the central cavity and circulate around a little bit, and then it'll flow out of one exit pore. And you can see these large exit pores over here. So if you were able to track the water near this picture, you'd see that the water is being flowed through the sponge this way. And as it flows through, they kind of filter out the stuff in the water, and that's how they feed. Now, our sponges, the way the water flows is because they have these clanocytes or these collar cells, 
and what they'll have is this flagellum and all the flagellum inside will beat and that'll pull water inside because these beating flagella are pushing the water out so it's kind of making a hole that'll fill up with water from the outside and that's how they get their food inside so those are our sponges okay the next phylum is the cnidarians and the cnidarians are made up of our jellyfish our sea anemones our corals and our hydras and there's a lot of interesting things about the cnidarians um, they have two different stages of life they have a medusa stage which is kind of like what we see in a jellyfish where they'll have a mouth that leads into a central cavity here they'll have two tissue layers here and then they have these tentacles and they'll swim around they're mobile animals in the medusa stage the medusa will then land and it forms the polyp stage and it's kind of like if we took the medusa and stuck it to a rock upside down we can see these two layers here the mouth is here our central cavity here and then the tentacles are going to be out this way now one other interesting thing about the cnidarians are the fact they have these nemocysts here and these are basically the stinging cells so if you know the jellyfish can sting corals can sting sea anemones can sting even the hydras can sting the reason they do this is because of these nemocysts here and what they do is they'll have these charged up little cells here and that's before it discharges so they'll either have a physical mechanical trigger there so if you brush up against it it can sting you or it can be um, a chemical trigger or a temperature trigger but somehow or another it's going to have something there and what will happen is, is these cells will fill with water and it'll force out this little thread here and the end of the thread is where you'll see a bunch of different things where it can be just a simple little opening at the end and it'll inject out poison that way some of them are going to look a little bit more like a christmas tree kind of point here and that'll actually go in and stick and it'll continue to release poison that way and then other ones are just kind of be this like twisted hook that'll just go out and hold on to it so they have a bunch of these different stinging cells but that's one of the things that makes the cnidarian special Okay, we're gonna discuss three different phyla that are kind of related. These are the vermiforms, or the worms, basically. The platyhelminthes are often called the flatworms, and those are the ones that are gonna make up the most of it. Um, they're also the flukes and the tapeworms we see down here, and they're called this because they're kind of flattened out as an organism. They have bilateral symmetry, which means that you can cut them down the middle and one side's the same as the other. And when we look at our flatworm over here, what we'll notice is they have eye spots. So they do have the ability to see light and dark. They can't probably make images. They don't have a true brain. They have a ganglia instead. They'll have nerve cords that you can see. And then they kind of have this entering here where they'll feed. So the flatworms um, are just like a squished out kind of a worm, kind of basic, kind of simple. You don't see a lot of differentiation in the platyhelminthes. Next up is the phylum nematoda, or the nematodes, and these are our round worms. And they're gonna see, if you look in the picture here, they'll be smooth, round, all the way around. They have that kind of symmetry, but we're seeing a little bit more of differentiation inside of the nematode. If we take a look real quickly, we'll see a distinct mouth here and a distinct anus. So they have a one-way digestive tract going on here. Um, they'll have a piercing device so they'll actually extend that out to break through the skin of whatever it is that they're attacking and then that's how they'll get inside that way to feed um, they do have ovaries so there are males and females we can see a reproductive pore going on here and they kind of have like we said a very rudimentary one-way digestive tract and these are the roundworms the last phylum that we're going to talk about in the worms are the annelids, and these are our segmented worms. And what that means is that the worm on the outside, you can see how it's broken down into these little segments here, these little different pieces. And you can see, once again, what we're noticing is a mouth here, an anus here, so it's a one-way digestive tract. It's a little bit better developed. They have a gizzards, intestines, stomach, kind of, sort of. Um, you'll see that they have the rudimentary portions of a heart here. It's basically a bunch of pumping vessels that'll go there. They have a little bit of a cerebral ganglia. Wouldn't necessarily call it a brain, but it's closed. And then they have these ganglia that go down the whole way. Now there's three different annelid classes that we like to talk about. Um, the one that you're probably most familiar with from the picture here will be the oligochaeta. These are the earthworms and the earthworms have these segments as you can see. Um, another group is the Hyrudinia or the leeches. And if you ever have a leech and you have a look at it, you can see that it is actually a segmented worm. 
And then there's the polychaete worms, and these are the marine worms. And I have a picture of a feather duster here, and then we have a fire worm down here. And you can see the segments here. The feather duster, it actually lives inside of a sheath that it produces. But if you could see the worm, you would see that it's segmented there as well. Okay, so let's summarize what we've learned about the animal kingdom so far. We talked about five different phyla so far. The first one was the periphera, and these are our sponges. And our sponges had a body wall of two cell layers. They had pores which water flew into and canals which water flew out. We didn't see any tissues or organs in the periphera. They lived in the water, and they basically made their living from straining food from the water. Next up were the cnidarians, and these were our jellyfish, corals, sea anemones. And these ones had a bag-like body of two cell layers. So they had like a bag of a body there with one opening, and that led into this hollow cavity. We started to see tissues here, and we saw radial symmetry, and it's also where we saw the nemocysts or the stinging cells. Next up were the flatworms or the platyhelminthes, and our example would be like our tapeworms here. Um, they had a flat, thin body, hence the name flatworm. We see three cell layers and organs. Now, they did have a digestive system, but their digestive system has one opening. So everything came in one way and went out one way, kind of a rudiment from the cnidarians that we saw earlier. They did have a nervous system, and they had bilateral symmetry, which means that if you cut them in half, you had a right and a left side. Up next are the nematodes, or the roundworms, and they, our example would be our hookworm. And they had a round, slender body to them, and here we see a digestive system with two openings, so it's a one-way digestive system. They had a little bit more developed nervous system, and again, they have bilateral symmetry. And finally, that brought us to our last phylum in this video, and those were the annelids, or the segmented worms. They were kind of round, and they have a segmented body, that's the key. They do have a fully functional digestive system and a nervous system, and they start seeing the beginnings of a circulatory system. They do have this bilateral symmetry as well, and we notice that these ones here are not parasitic. These ones aren't feeding off something else or relying on something else. These are actually able to live on their own, and we talked about our examples being the earthworm or the polychaete marine worms or leeches. So that's it for this video. Good luck with the lessons, and as always, we'll see you in the next video. Aloha and welcome to our second video on the animal kingdom. We'll talk more about the invertebrates. In this video, we will discuss mollusks, arthropods, and the echinoderms. All right, the next phylum is the phylum mollusca, or the mollusks. The phylum mollusca is made up of several different kinds of organisms. You can see our representative here is a gastropod or a snail. We also have the slugs. We have the cephalopods, which would be our nautilus, but more so our squids, octopus, and cuttlefish. We have our bivalves, which are our oysters and our clams. And then finally, we have the chitons here. And we're seeing a lot more specialization inside of these guys. Most of them will have a shell. Um, the octopus has lost it. The squids have degenerated. Slugs have degenerated as well. And then we have the snails, which have a well-pronounced shell also. We're noticing that we have differentiation in the digestive system. So we're starting to see intestines form, stomachs form. We have a heart, so we're seeing a true circulatory system in these guys. Um, one of the interesting things, they have a mouth, and inside the mouth they have this radula, and that's kind of like a tongue, but it has like some sharp projections on it. Some of these snails can actually drill into other snails' shells using this radula. They'll have a strong foot, and that's how they'll move around. So we can see them kind of moving across like that. When it's a clam, it'll help them dig. When it's a snail, that's what they move across on. And the mollusks, like I said, it's just this wide variety, but we notice it primarily with these shells here. Next up is the phylum Arthropoda, and Arthropoda means jointed legs. So if we look at this picture down here, we can find a leg of a grasshopper, an insect, a praying mantis, and a crustacean, a crayfish. And we'll notice that in all of these examples, they have a jointed leg, which allows them a little bit more motion. And that's what Arthropoda refers to. They also have an exoskeleton, so they're all covered in a harder outer shell, and it needs to have those joints so they're able to move. Otherwise, you'd just be kind of like stuck there. Um, the other thing that the arthropods go through is this process called metamorphosis. And there's two different kinds of metamorphosis. We have complete and incomplete metamorphosis. In complete metamorphosis, we see a drastic change of body type.
So we start off with our eggs here, it hatches into a larvae, and if you look at the larvae here, that larvae will continue to develop into a pupa, and then we form our adult. And if you look at the larvae and the adult, you'll notice that they have two distinctly different looking bodies. It's not a bad example here, but think caterpillar and butterfly, how a caterpillar and a butterfly look totally different. In complete metamorphosis, your eggs hatch into what we call a nymph, and if you look at the adult, they kind of look the same. So incomplete doesn't have that drastic body change. Now the arthropods are a huge group of variation animals, probably one of the largest groups that are out there for phyla. If you look at our different groups, we have the uniramia, and in the uniramia we have our centipedes, millipedes, and our insects. We also have the chelicerata, and in the chelicerata we see our horseshoe crabs and our arachnids, our spiders and scorpions. And then finally we have the crustaceans, and in the crustaceans we have our crabs and our crayfish, but we also have pill bugs, water fleas, and little tiny copepods. So as you can see, the phylum arthropoda is this really huge and diverse group of animals that are out there. Next up is the phylum Echinodermata. Echinodermata, echino is spine, dermata is skin, so these are our spiny skinned organisms. What we notice with the Echinodermata is now we have an endoskeleton. So where we had an exoskeleton or a skeleton on the outside in the arthropods, it's moved to the inside for the echinoderms. And you'll see these little spiny projections that are gonna be on the skin here. Now, if we look at our representative types of echinoderms, we have our crinoids, which are gonna be a stalked one, and then we'll kinda of see this basic general body plan for the echinoderm here. All right, we have our sea stars, the asteroidia, which are there, and they're related to the brittle stars, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. We can see a starfish here, and then we have our brittle star over here. So we can see the difference between the two. We have our holothurians, which are the sea cucumbers, and you can see one over here. And that's kind of if we just took the starfish and stretched it out this way. And then if we compressed it down and covered it in spines, we would have our sea urchins as well. So these are our five representative echinoderms. One of the other things that makes them unique is the fact that they have tube feet. And they use these for locomotion, and they can also use them to hold on to things. And quite simply, that's just going to be a stalk, and at the end of the stalk, they're going to have like a little suction cup, and that'll allow them to stick, and they can release them, and they can use those to move across the ocean floor. So in summary, let's take a look at our last three phyla. We started with the mollusca, the mollusks, and those are like our snails, our octopus, and they have a soft body covered by a fleshy mantle. They move with a muscular foot. Some of them will have a shells. They have all organ systems, so that's nice, and they have bilateral symmetry. And they can feed by using this specialized tongue-looking thingy called a radula. Next up were the arthropods, and these are the segmented body, and they had jointed legs. Most of them have antennas, so we can start seeing an increase in the use of senses out there to explore the world around them. And these guys here had an exoskeleton. And the exoskeleton was kind of interesting. It's a hard outer covering, so when they got bigger, they'd actually have to shed these exoskeletons, and it'll show you this in the lessons. And then the last group were the echinodermata, and these are the spiny-skinned organisms. Their body were all five parts in radial symmetry, and they're all living in the ocean. And we can see these five parts here in our sea star. Okay, so that's it for the invertebrates. Um, as always, the lessons will go into a little more detail. Good luck on the lessons, and we'll see you in the next video. Aloha, and welcome to our last video on the animal kingdom. In this video, we will talk about the vertebrates. So, our goals for the video are to describe the main features of them to all vertebrates. We'll list the evolutionary history of the phylum chordata. We'll go through and describe the features of the eight vertebrate classes, and we'll list the features of human beings. So first up, let's talk about what makes a vertebrate a vertebrate. First of all, they have a skeleton inside their body, an endoskeleton, and we saw that with the echinoderms. The skeleton is going to be made of bone and cartilage in vertebrates, Cartilage is that soft material, kind of like what makes your ear its shape. Some invertebrates do have an internal skeleton, but it's not made of bone. So it's a little bit of a different kind of internal skeleton. Second, the vertebrates have a backbone. And a vertebra is a bone or a block of cartilage that makes up the backbone, and that's how we get the name vertebrates. 
And then third, the vertebrates all have a skull, and the skull surrounds and protects the brain. So we're going to see a little bit of a larger brain that's going to need that protection of a skull, and then that's going to run down into the backbone, and the backbone is going to protect like our spinal cord. Okay, one of the interesting things about the phylum chordata and the vertebrates is that they have this evolutionary history that's tied into their development. So when you see the larvae and the zygotes starting to develop, they all go through this evolutionary history and we can see four different things processed that are unique to the chordates. First up is they have this dorsal hollow nerve cord and you can see it in blue over here on our drawing. And this dorsal hollow nerve cord eventually will separate out and it'll form the brain and then the spinal cord. But all of them start off with this hollow nerve cord. Next up, we have this forming of a stiff notochord and that's gonna be this right here. And this kind of goes along the dorsal side, runs along the nerve cord there. And that kind of gives it a little bit of protection and a little bit of shape or a little bit of structure. Third, the chordate embryos develop pharyngeal slits or opening in the sides of the pharynx. So they have these little like precursors to what we would call gills forming here. And then finally, fourth, all the chordate embryos have a tail that's going to extend out beyond where the anus is. So they all have this tail. So even us as chordates, as we're developing, we start off with a solo nerve cord. We will have the notochord form. We have a little bit of a tail. We still have a remnant of it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the course. And then finally, we do have these pharyngeal slits as well. Within the vertebrate phyla, we have eight different classes. And we're going to go through those real quickly here. Um, as always, the lessons will go through them in a little more detail, but I just wanted to go through and real quickly show you what they're all about. The first one is actually a combination here. This is two different classes. This is the Myxini and the Salaphidospidomorphi. These are quite simply our lampreys and our hagfish. Now they have a cartilaginous skeleton. They don't have any scales and these are the jawless fishes is what they're often referred to as. They breathe with gills, they live in the water, and they tend to be cold-blooded. So these guys here are kind of primordial, kind of ancestral, they're kind of a throwback as to what our first vertebrates kind of probably looked like. Next up are the fun guys. These are the chondrichthys. These also have a skeleton of cartilage, but then these guys are going to have a little bit more to them. They'll have scales, and these scales are going to be almost tooth-like. They're called denticles because they're made of the same material as teeth. These do have a jaw. Um, they have paired fins. They'll breathe with gills. They live in the water. This cold-blooded is kind of for most of them. Some of them we kind of think of as cool-blooded, which means they regulate their body temperature a little bit, but not to the same degree as warm-blooded. And our chondrichthys includes our shark skates and rays. And then finally, on our first slide here, we'll talk about are the osteichthys, and these are the bony fishes. So they'll have a skeleton made of bones. They have bony scales and they have jaws, paired fins again. They also use gills. They breathe in the water. Most of the osteichthys have this special function called a swim bladder, and basically it's like a balloon inside their body that they can control the amount of gas inside, and that keeps them from being stuck on the bottom. So they can put a little more gas in, and that'll cause them to rise up towards the surface. They can take some out, and it'll take it down. It also keeps them oriented the right way. So if you ever have the chance to catch and clean a fish, if you open it up, you can find this little like swim bladder or an air bladder inside of them. Next up are the amphibians, the amphibia class. They also have a skeleton of bone. They have a moisture, smooth skin, so they're tied to the water for the most part. They now breathe with lungs, or some of them can even breathe through their skin as adults. These ones here have a duality of life, kind of. Some of them as a young live in the water, they all do. And some adults have the ability to come out on land like a frog does. They'll have four legs and their eggs lack a shell. So that ties them to having to return to the water to reproduce. And like we said, these are our frogs and our toads and our salamanders. Next up are the reptiles in the class Reptilia. These also have a bony skeleton, which we'll see in all of them. 
but the reptilians have a dry scaly skin so unlike the wet moist skin of the amphibians the reptiles can actually hold more moisture inside of them they tend to have claws they do have lungs and they breathe with their lungs at all stages they do have four legs except for the snakes which have regenerated or degenerated those legs away and then their eggs now have a shell and that's kind of neat they have a amniotic shell which we see here which is a bunch of layers but because their eggs have this shell they're able to lay them on land and that'll hold the water inside of them so now we have animals that can live their entire life on the land remember the amphibians had to return to water for reproductive purposes to lay the eggs the reptiles are able to lay them on land next up are the class aves or the birds and as always they have this bony skeleton now these have a unique trait in feathers and feathers are like a modified looking scale. So, and the feathers allow them to fly. They also provide a little bit of warmth. So they're able to keep some body warmth inside of them. And now we're starting to see warm blooded animals. They also have an egg with a shell. So they're able to live their entire life on land. They breathe with lungs at all stages again. And these ones here will have wings which allow them to fly, beaks and claws. So those are our birds. And finally, we get to the class mammalia or the mammals, and that would be ours. They again have this bony skeleton, and now we get our unique traits for the mammals. The first is hair. So if it has hair, it has to be a mammal. And then they have their mammary glands, which is why we're called the mammals. And they produce milk. So the young are going to develop within the mother, but then they'll feed on this milk from the mammary glands. They also have lungs, and these ones are warm-blooded. The hair actually helps trap in some heat, so it works that way for them. And our mammals would be like us, and as well as the whales and such. Okay, finally, we're gonna talk about the features of humans. What makes us human? There's two features I wanna focus on in the video, and they do the same in the lessons. One of them is gonna be culture, and that's a body of knowledge that we're able to pass from one generation to the next. So that includes things like language and what we wear and manners and our sense of humor. All of these things focus into our culture and we're able to pass that knowledge from one generation to the next. The other trait that separates us from the rest of the animal world is this nature of bipedalism, walking on two legs instead of our arms and legs like the gorilla you see here doing. What this does is this is a result of a change in the pelvis and the change in the formation of the leg bones. We'll see some variations there as well. But the big difference comes here in the skull. And what it did is it got our skulls up a little bit higher. We changed the orientation a little bit and we were able to use other things like tools. So we started to grow a larger brain and we noticed that up here. And that's one of the things that separates us from the rest of the animals. Okay, well that's it for the video. Um, as always, good luck on the lessons and we will see you in the next video.